This is a video about Cauchy sequences of real numbers. So the first thing we might think about, it would be nice to know if you, if you had a sequence that was convergent, if you knew that a sequence was convergent, uh, even if you don't have a good candidate for what the limit should actually be. And we saw that type of thing with like the monotone convergence theorem, where I don't know what the limit is necessarily, but if you've got a bounded sequence that's always increasing or is always decreasing, then it's gotta converge. I don't know to what, but I sleep better at night knowing that it converges. So here's an idea though that maybe you've thought about when you've been thinking about convergence. So if you had a sequence that converges, that means that the term should get arbitrarily close to whatever that limit value is. Maybe the book calls it X, or maybe we call it L. But think about, shouldn't that mean that like the terms themselves should be getting arbitrarily close to each other at the same time? All right, so then that idea is kind of the basis for what it means for a sequence Xn to be Cauchy. And it's named after a famous mathematician. <laughs> Cauchy. So we're going to say that Xn is Cauchy if the following. So the definition is for all epsilon, there should exist a natural number such that for all indices past that natural number n, we should always have that the distance between any two points in your sequence that are past that mark should be smaller than epsilon. So in a picture, uh, what does that look like? Over here, I'm saying that once I get to the points in my sequence that are past this magical number n here, I'm saying that all the points should fit inside that epsilon window. In other words, the vertical distance between two points, so think about the vertical distance between say this one to that one, right? That vertical distance should be smaller than epsilon, which yeah, it sure is. So for any two points that you pick to the right of n there. All right, so then this video is all about this concept and about to how it relates to the idea of what it means to be convergent. So to give you some examples though, of how do you work with, again, another one of these epsilon definitions that seems a little abstract, so you might need some practice to get used to it. How would we show that something like uh, one over n, there should not be an n right there, ignore that, is Cauchy. So how would we show that's Cauchy? So what we're gonna try to do is just use the definition in order to do that. So what would that look like? That would look like, so what do I want? I wanna make sure that eventually the terms are within epsilon of each other. And so let's play with that in there, because I've got some expressions for what xn should look like. It's one over the index, one over n. So if I start playing with that, that looks like one over m minus one over n, just because again, that's my sequence here. Um, and so let's see, I could use the triangle inequality. So when I say play with this, start doing some tricks to it. So I could use the triangle inequality to say that's less than or equal to one plus m plus uh, one over n plus one plus over n, goodness gracious. And now let's look at each of these. So what if I make each of these big enough so that each one of these is smaller than epsilon over two? Well, in that case, like how would I do that then? What do I want to have happen? I would want to have happen then that maybe how far out of my sequence do I need to go? What is n? I would really like for uh, one over n to be less than epsilon over two. Maybe in case you'd see that. So. In that case, if large, if capital N is bigger than both of those, then this inequality would be true, and I would win the game if this was less than epsilon over two. So that's the intuition for that. So again, this is your scratch work to get a good candidate for what your N should be for this you know, arbitrary epsilon. And so the point then, if I was to solve that inequality, one over N less than epsilon over two, solve that thing for epsilon, I'm sorry, for N, that tells you that N should be bigger than two divided by epsilon. So that's all your scratch work. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the pieces of the puzzle together in a more formal proof. So here's the actual proof. Let epsilon be arbitrary, some arbitrary positive number. And now we're gonna choose n, some natural number n, so that it's larger than two divided by this arbitrary epsilon that we started with. So then for all indices, little m, little n, larger than or equal to this magical capital N, we should have the following. The distance between xm and xn is exactly equal to the distance between one over m and one over n. Use your triangle inequality that we did above. That's less than or equal to that. And uh, what do we know? If uh, m and n are both larger than capital N, then again, this should be smaller than one over capital N, and this should be smaller than one over capital N. And that's my next line. Hey, look at that. Each of those are less than epsilon over two. And thus, at the very end of the day, I get that the distance between any two points past this index here really, I guess I should highlight that, past that index capital N, or within epsilon of each other. And so we just make sure that this sequence one over N has this behavior here. All the rest of the points fit inside of this window. Great. So 
How would you show that a sequence is not Cauchy? So this is a bad sequence. Minus one to the n plus one is not a Cauchy sequence. So we would need to negate that epsilon definition above. And so like all the kind of universal quantifiers turn into existential ones um, from your from like a proofs class. So what would it look like? There exists a specific epsilon zero such that for every natural number capital N, you can find two indices past that such that the distance between your two points is not uh, less than epsilon naught. It's at least epsilon naught. So in other words, you could always find two points later down in your sequence. And again, infinitely often, you could find two points later in your sequence who are not within epsilon naught of each other, no matter how far you go. So how would I do that for this? Well, what do I see? Well, I know that this really depends on what that power is, right? So it's gonna be different whether it's even or it's odd. So if n is 2k, well then xn looks like x sub 2k. So plug that in, and if you evaluate that, you'd get two. Similarly, when m is 2k minus one, an odd number, then what's xm look like? In other words, what's the sequence look like when your indices odd? Well, it looks like minus one to the 2k minus one power plus one, which is zero, I believe. And so what are we saying should happen here? Why don't, what happens when I pick M and N to be these guys? So if epsilon naught is one, right? Then what if I measured the distance between these two points, XM minus XN? Well, it would be zero minus two, according to the work that I just did. So that would be two, but wait a minute. That's no matter what, right? That, that's, that's bigger than one, so that's bad. Good for us, because we're gonna prove it's not Cauchy. So what do I mean by bad? This is a bad sequence, it's not Cauchy. So choose epsilon not equal one. By the way, so the green is just kind of some intuition for how do you play with it? How do you put this together into a formal proof? So if epsilon not equal to one, then for every natural number capital N, you could always find an even number and an odd number that are just past that capital N, right? And so in that case then, what does it look like whenever you look at the terms with an even index and with an odd index? Well, it's zero minus two is what we just showed above in green. And so that is two, which is larger than one. Therefore, we have just showed that this definition of what it means to not be Cauchy holds. So let's get into some big results about Cauchy sequences. So if a sequence converges, that implies that it's Cauchy. And so uh, to give you an example, or maybe a picture of why you should believe this, uh, look at this picture here. If I know that the sequence Xn converges, then it should get arbitrarily close to L. And so in particular, I should be able to go far enough out in the sequence so that all the rest of the sequence, all the rest of the numbers in my sequence are within epsilon over two of L. But wait a minute, if all the numbers are within epsilon over two of L, I mean, doesn't that mean that for any two uh, points in my sequence past that, they should be within epsilon uh, over of each other. And so uh, I hope that you say yes to that. And that would show that it's cozy. That's kind of the big idea here. So how do you put that into more of a formal proof? So let's say that L is the limit of the sequence and let's let epsilon be bigger than zero. And what are we gonna do? Well, in that case, because Xn converges, there exists a natural number capital N, so that once you get past it, I know that all the points in my sequence are within epsilon over two of L. So I'm describing to you this part of the picture here. All the points in there should lie in that orange window around L. But wait a minute, that tells me that, okay, well, what if I took any two indices past capital N here? So that's all I'm doing right here. And what if I looked at just the distance between those two points in my sequence? And so uh, what I'm gonna do also is, you know, your favorite math trick, where I'm gonna add and subtract L inside of here. That's what I've done here. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is the real analysis part. I'm gonna use the triangle inequality to split that up conveniently, where it's gonna be XM minus this L plus uh, XN minus L. Remember, you could factor that, absolute, that negative sign out. And so that'll be less than epsilon over two plus epsilon over two, which is just epsilon. And that proves it. So what'd you just do? You just guaranteed that once you're far enough in the sequence, all the points are within, there should be that less than there, all the points are within epsilon of each other. The next thing I want to tell you is that Cauchy sequences are bounded. So in a picture here, if uh, all the points eventually, eventually they all get within epsilon of each other, then pick an epsilon. So eventually, if epsilon is one, eventually I should be able to say that all the points are within one of each other. Well, in that case, that takes care of every single one of these points this way, just for emphasis there. So those are all less than at least one plus uh, your, your, uh, your L. And so uh, in that case then, whatever the limit is, 
And in the next case, I just need to look back here. Well, what's the biggest out of these in absolute value? So in my picture, it'd be this one, right? That would be the, uh, well, I guess really, actually, sorry about that. It would be this one. <laughs> That's the tallest absolute value. Goodness gracious. So how would I say that this sequence, any Cauchy sequence is bounded? Again, we're just looking at these two different pieces. There's only finitely many terms to the left, to the left of n to consider. And then for these infinitely many ones, they're just left less than whatever the limit is plus a particular epsilon that you pick. So I'll try to say that a little bit more clearly in the proof here. Suppose that your sequence is Cauchy. Then for epsilon equal to one, there should be an n such that once you get past capital N, the terms are within one of each other. Well, by the reverse triangle inequality, we can split this up. This is actually bigger than the difference of the two um, you know, individual absolute values. And so that's all less than one. And so what we'll do is we'll take this and we'll add it over to this side with one here. So in particular, uh, again, look at this, right? For all indices little n larger than capital N, for all of these are always less than that, that first, or maybe, what do I mean by that first? The first point of this tail, right? Xn plus one, plus that epsilon. So what we've just done is we've just created a specific bound for all the natural numbers past that magical index n. And now what we'll do is we'll look backwards. So for all n, uh, xn should be smaller than the supremum of, well, the one we just found, but then just look at the points, whichever is the biggest of the points before. And so, again, supremum is kind of a goofy word for this, since there's only these finitely many things. You could probably just say, pick the biggest one out of here, and that's a good bound for all the points in the sequence. All right, so a sequence xn converges if and only if it's Cauchy. This is the most important thing that we'll do. And so we already proved the forward direction. I already know that convergent sequences are Cauchy. So the harder direction is if it's Cauchy, is a conversion. And so what do we know? If it's Cauchy, then it's bounded. That was the previous result. And what do I know about bounded sequences? Bolzano Weierstrass comes to save us. Remember that theorem told us that any bounded sequence has a convergent subsequence. We're going to call this convergent subsequence of Xn, we'll call it X of Nk. It's our typical notation for subsequences. And let's actually like put some concrete numbers down. Let's well, concrete. Let's say that the limit of the subsequence is this number x star. So what I'm going to try to show you is that the limit of the whole sequence is also x star. And uh, so how would we do that? I want to show that this limit is true. So we're going to use the epsilon definition to do it. So let's let epsilon be bigger than zero. So what do I know again? I know that the sequence xn is Cauchy, but I also know that the subsequence xnk converges to x star. That's what we set up here. What I think I have for you next is a picture. So we can find some index capital N. In other words, I can go far enough out of my sequence such that uh, the following picture happens. So what's going on in my picture? I care about maybe this here. So what's going on? I know that uh, because it's Cauchy, the sequence is Cauchy, all the, all the terms in the sequence after this point in this tail should be within, I could make sure that they're within epsilon over two of each other as long as I go far enough to the right here. But then simultaneously, I should be able to find n big enough so that all the points in the subsequence, which I've leveled for you, are within epsilon over two of x star. So I should be able to find n again that makes both of these things happen simultaneously. So what should I have then? Again, this is just kind of restating the fact that you know that your sequence is Cauchy. All the terms to the right of this capital N should be within epsilon over two of each other. Again, if I choose N big enough. And then also simultaneously, all the terms in my subsequence should be within epsilon over two of the limit X star. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna use these two facts for all N larger than or equal to capital N. In other words, to keep describing what's going on in this picture over here. What if I considered how do the rest of the points in my sequence, not just the subsequence, how do all the points in my sequence relate to x star once I'm past this index, capital N? And what we're going to do is, again, the similar trick. I'm going to add and subtract xnk inside of here because I know how xnk plays with each of these individually. That's maybe the intuition for that. We'll split this up with the triangle inequality of we've done. These are each made, we've gone far enough in our sequence so that we've made each of these individual distances less than epsilon over two. And you see that the next step is we win the game because we have just justified that xn is always within epsilon, always within epsilon of x star. Therefore, the limit of xn of the whole sequence is also x star.